the 11th of July, 1865, a 25-year-old artist called Edward Wimper set out in the Alps to climb a mountain thought to be unclimbable, the Matterhorn. He'd tried seven times before, Swiss and Italian teams had tried, but on the 14th of July, he, a Brit, became the first man to get to the summit of the Matterhorn. No mountain was too high for the Victorians, the conquerors. The Victorians were the ultimate conquerors, setting out to discover the world and make it their own. British explorers in their pith helmets, their solar topies, travelled the globe, pushing back the boundaries of the empire. People like David Livingstone spread British ideology and commerce right through the uncharted continents of Asia and Africa. For the early Victorians, much of the world remained unexplored, ready to be converted, but also exploited. The interior of Africa was plundered for diamonds and gold. At the same time, explorers were also discovering some valuable plants on the other side of the world. In fact, the transfer of just a few key plants changed the world forever. Control of materials like rubber became enormously important as the Victorians eventually used it for everything from bicycle tyres to raincoats and Wellington boots. Unfortunately, most of the world's rubber came from Portuguese Brazil. The British wanted a slice of the action, so in 1877 they took seeds from Brazil to Malaysia and launched a new British-controlled rubber industry. Meanwhile, other plants were desperately needed for their medicinal properties. One of the worst diseases facing man is malaria. All over the world, malaria was the big problem faced by the British colonies, by the administrators, and this bark holds the key to malaria. It is from this bark that you get quinine. The problem with quinine was that all the trees from which it came were under Spanish control. The British were desperate to get hold of quinine, as were the Dutch, so collectors were sent out to the Andes to look for the seeds and eventually send them back to Kew. The British were then able to plant the seeds and harvest their own supply of quinine, essential protection against malaria for expat Victorians. The Victorians were exploring nature and mapping the world. But most important of all, they were the leaders of the pack. And they were determined to show it. So in 1851, they organized the greatest event of the age, the great exhibition of the industry of all nations. This was the world's first international exhibition, packed with over 100,000 shining examples of craft and technology from all over the world. An elephant's howdah from India competed for attention with a reaping machine from America, an 80-bladed penknife, and even a giant bed from Vienna, which was bought by the Queen. It was a truly international exhibition, and yet, of almost 14,000 exhibitors, over half were British. Visitors from all over the world could plainly see Britain's industrial supremacy. But the most memorable part of any visit must have been the exhibition building itself, surprisingly inspired not by industry, but by nature. A lily, which grew thousands of miles away in the Amazon jungle. Just look at this extraordinary plant. 
The first seeds were brought back in 1846, 25 of them, and they were brought here to Kew, but they were very, very difficult to grow. In fact, of those 25, only two germinated, and both those plants died. But a greenhouse designer called Joseph Paxton cultivated a plant which did finally produce flowers. And he was so pleased and proud of it that he called it Victoria in honour of the Queen, and he gave her a flower. This particular species is Victoria cruziana. Now, extraordinarily, the structure of the leaf actually gave him a new idea about how to build greenhouses. Paxton's inspiration came from this. This is the underneath of one of those giant lily leaves. And all these veins and so on, he just took these and replaced them by iron ribs. Paxton realised that by scaling up the design of one of his greenhouses, he could build a huge modular structure of iron and glass. In a flash, he had thought up the Crystal Palace, the most radical building of the age. And this is where it all happened, London's Hyde Park. In six months, more than six million people flocked here to see all the wonders of the world in the Crystal Palace, the most innovative building in the world, built right here on this stretch of grass. The extraordinary thing is there's no trace of it now, nothing on the ground, no plaque, it's not even shown on the maps. But we are going to change all that. Finding its exact position is a matter of detective work. So I've enlisted the help of Ken Kiss, an expert on the Crystal Palace, who has some essential clues. Ken, hi. Oh, hello. Hi. Now, I know, I've read about the Crystal Palace, but I gather you think you know where it was. Indeed, yes, I think we've got the exact position by using this photograph. You'll see here it shows this lodge building, which oh, still stands. Oh, this one? Indeed. You mean the thing? It was right there? Just there, where the trees are in the background. The front That's entrance? Exactly the spot. So the Queen would have driven up in her carriage and gone in here? Indeed she would. And with the aid of the railings and the building, the position of the two, we were able to get the correct angle that the photograph was taken and thereby mark out the line of the building. Brilliant. That's wonderful mathematical detective work. So, can we go and sort it out on the ground? Yes, of course. Let's do that. That's it, 450. There, so this is the corner of the building. That's the corner of the building right. there. Ah, oh, we should have stopped for a coffee now. Anyone on the other side? Hope for the best. And that's the spot there. There? Yes, just okay. there. OK. It had horses on it. Yes. And here we are. This is the centre point. It's absolutely huge. It's a 1,000 feet that way, a 1,000 feet that way, and incredibly wide, beyond the trees on both sides. It's an enormous space. From above, the vast scale of the Crystal Palace can really be appreciated. It actually covered about the same area as the Millennium Dome and it was built in just six months. I would really love to know what the Crystal Palace looked like. And so we've challenged a small iron foundry to build just a corner of it, a tiny little bit, to the original specifications, right here in Hyde Park. I can't wait to see what it's like. Iron hulls brought strength and speed to ships, but they also introduced a new problem because they interfered with the crucial process of navigation. All that iron had a serious effect on the compass. Look at this, this is my compass, and you can see that north is in that direction, almost in that weather vane. And if I stick my compass in a wooden boat, it doesn't affect true north, it still points in the right direction. But look what happens when I put it in an iron boat. You can see that it begins to spin. And in some places in the iron boat, it's much worse. Look at that, it's now pointing over there. It's about 30 degrees wrong. If I believe this compass, I'd probably go crashing into Greenland or something like that. This was a serious problem. Well, the great scientific minds wrestled with it, and they realized it must be possible to compensate by using magnets. And so they began to experiment. It took the great mind of a brilliant scientist called Lord Kelvin to solve the problem. 
He invented a system that used groups of magnets which could be arranged around a ship's compass to counteract the effect of the iron hull. And he called his invention the binnacle. This is where the compass is, mounted so it can swing in any direction and compensate for the rolling of the ship. And it says the Lord Kelvin compass card here. And in this wooden housing is a very complicated array of magnets, big vertical correcting magnets there, a healing bucket here, look, a bucket with magnets in it that you lower in on a chain to exactly the height you need to compensate for the healing of the ship. And here are the Kelvin spheres, soft iron balls that you can move in and out like this, and on the back the Flinders tube with yet more magnetic correction. With this wonderful bit of high technology, the British sailors had a considerable advantage, at least for a time, over their maritime rivals. But there was one thing even the Victorians could not control. The weather. However, they did try to predict it, using a rather unusual method. The trusty leech. This weird contraption was invented by one somewhat eccentric Victorian in an attempt to forecast storms. This is a tempest prognosticator, and it was first shown by its inventor, Dr George Merriweather, at the Great Exhibition of 1851. Now, this is not the original. This one's been lovingly rebuilt by Phil Collins here at Barometer World in Devon. Phil, you had to follow his original design, I gather. That's right. We're fortunate that there's a surviving line drawing from the Great Exhibition catalogue, and so we've gone to meticulous detail in copying it in every way. It's one of the most absurd methods of forecasting or foretelling the weather, as they would have said back then, and uh, it's based on leeches. So, explain to me how it works now. If it's going to be stormy weather, one would expect the leeches to try and get out, and to do that they go through this little brass tube and push that little bit of white bone there. And that releases the trip, which is attached to this wire here, and that's attached to the chain, which comes up here to the little hammer right. and rings the bell. Oh, I see. So it's all gravity, leech-assisted gravity. That's right. There was some method behind Merriweather's design. The idea was that leeches move around in response to changes in electrical activity before a storm. So, can the leeches tell us whether there's a storm brewing today? Go on, jump, jump. Go on, it's very stormy. It's a tense moment. He's going for it. Climb, climb. Go on, thunder. International trade was expanding rapidly. Cotton picked in Egypt or America was being shipped over here, spun and woven in the mills in Lancashire, and then the cloth was being shipped out again and sold in the Far East. All the people involved in this trade needed to communicate, and quickly. But in 1837, there were no phones, no faxes, no email. How were they going to send messages across the vast expanse of the oceans? The answer to long-distance communication was the electric telegraph. The electric telegraph was first used by railways for simple signalling using codes, like the dots and dashes of the Morse code. Soon, ordinary people were able to send and receive telegrams. A network of telegraph cables spread rapidly across Britain. But to lay cables across the world was not nearly so easy, and connecting Britain to America was the greatest challenge of all. John Packer is an expert on submarine telegraphy. John, tell me how it became possible to send messages across the Atlantic. It was a development of the early telegraph systems that were used on the railways and on inland networks, and I can demonstrate here the sort of things that we used. Right. We start off with a battery. Yes. We connect the battery to the sending device, which is something that looks rather like two Morse keys. Mm. We then go along our line to the receiving end, right. which is simply a needle on a dial, which moves to the left or to the right as the left or right key are pressed. Oh, so you have a code then? Left, it's right, left, right. similar to Morse code, so left and right on the key, represented left and right on a needle of the receiver, and equated with the dots and dashes of the Morse code. Now, do you think we could get it to work over this vast stretch of water here? Well, we could have a go. (laughs) 
What was the first transatlantic cable? A great problem and very much of an experimental disaster. <laughs> the boats they used weren't really big enough. There were several attempts to lay it, and the most successful was when two vessels carried half the cable each. They met in mid-Atlantic, <laughs> they spliced the ends together, and then the ships sailed in opposite directions, paying out the cable and talking to each other through the cable to ensure that it was still OK. That was really cunning. They got, eventually, one unbroken piece of insulated copper between this country and North America, and the signals were very weak and feeble, so they kept increasing the voltage and ended up with about 2,000 volts. 2,000 volts? Naturally, the cable died on them. I'm not surprised. How did they manage to do it in the end? They hired the world's biggest boat at that time, which was the Great Eastern. Ah, oh, yes. That could carry almost the entire length in, in one go. Paddle wheels made the Great Eastern very manoeuvrable. And to stop the 2,000-mile-long cable from snapping, the ship was equipped with a massive gearing system to lower its load gently onto the seabed. Right, John, let's go. So, which one do we connect it to? Line, there we are, line. line goes on. And that's it, just one connection. Switch to transmit and we're ready for it. Okay, you stay there, send me a message when I get over there and I'll see if I can pick it up. Right. Let's see if it's gonna work. Send your signal! Yeah, yeah, look, look, it works. The needle's moving. Right, now I can send one back. Fantastic. Telegraph cables were soon straddling the world. Cables from America, India and even Australia fed into this tiny beach near Land's End, Porth Kerno Bay in Cornwall. So, Mary, the cables actually run right under our feet, is that right? Yes, from the cable hut at the top of the beach, under here and out to sea. Out to sea, fantastic. Yeah. Why Porth Kerno Beach? Well, as you can see, it's very sandy, there's no rocks, and the sand extends a long way under the sea, which was what gives the sea this lovely colour, and uh, so there's nothing to rub the cables or damage the cables. Also, there's no boats here, and they weren't. It was very, very quiet, so there right. are no anchors to drag and damage the cables. And this is actually a specimen of cable? This is a piece of cable, um, just to give you an idea of what it looks like. It has, the, the message goes through the core, and right. it's surrounded by an insulating material. This is this percha. is gutta percha, yep. lovely. And this is just steel, this is, is it? steel armouring. Right. The cable um, was subject to damage at the bottom of the sea with the tides, you can imagine with a storm, yeah. you've got it potentially rubbing on rocks further out to sea. But you've also got some animals, uh, sharks, Chewing if you call a shark an animal. Yeah. But they attracted to the, mag the magnetic field oh, really? um, somehow and took the odd bite. So something like that makes, means they don't make a second bite. At the head of the bay, the cables all fed into a single shed, a hub of Victorian communications. And this is the hut where it this all happened. It. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Great. That's, it's not exactly a palatial residence, is it? No. Gibraltar. Do you mean this cable is going all the way to Gibraltar? This piece of cable here is actually one physical link between here and Gibraltar, going and down the beach, under the sea, up the beach at the other end, and uh, originally into a hut like this at the other Fantastic. end. Fantastic. So. Now, why are the three to Gibraltar? Well, when they first laid one, yeah. they could send one message at a time. So if they wanted to send two messages at a time, they had to lay two cables. Oh, and if see. they wanted to send three, they had to lay three cables. Right. And do they stop at Gibraltar? This particular section will stop, but then they will be started again with another section which will go from Gibraltar to Malta, then another section which went from Malta to Alexandria. Yes, and so gotcha. it goes on until you get to Bombay. All the way to Bombay? Yeah. Yep. From this hut? Yes. Are they still connected? Can I shout down? Hello? Anyone there? No, I'm sorry. Equipped with a worldwide network, the Victorians were able to rule over a truly global economy. Even before Victoria came to the throne, ports like Liverpool were trading centres, but they would soon become important in another way. By 1840, these ports were packed with a more precious cargo, people, because the trading had shown that foreign lands were packed with riches and people wanted to go out there and collect them. 
Now, Liverpool was one of the main ports, and during Victoria's reign, something like five million people left this very port to seek a better life in the new world. And Britain, the conquering nation, attracted settlers too. Hundreds of thousands of people from all corners of the empire came to Britain to seek a new life here. There was no greater celebration of the multicultural empire than the great exhibition of the Crystal Palace. And Dominic Grosvenor now has his chance to recreate a part of it. It took more than 2,000 men over six months to assemble the iron modules of the original building. We're attempting to erect a corner in just one day. The first column erected in Hyde Park for 150 years. Now let's hope they can get the others up and the glass in too. 300,000 panes of glass, each an unprecedented four feet long, were hand blown by French and Belgian experts. Can you see the distortion and movement? Yes, in that? there's all sorts of lumps and bumps and stuff. Now if you hold that up to the trees or where you've got natural light, it'll sparkle and it'll refract light beautifully. And when the ironwork was glazed, the magazine Punch, as a joke, called the building the Crystal Palace and the nickname stuck. Well, it's done, at least it's almost done. We've got the whole of the frame up, all the cast iron, and we've got three sheets of glass in, just to get a, a hint of what it must have looked like. It must have been absolutely wonderful with this handmade glass all shimmering in the sunshine. I just think this is the most wonderful structure, and I'm delighted to have just a, a hint of what the original must have looked like. Six months in construction, six months open, and six million visitors, all to enable the world to experience the achievements of the world's greatest conquerors, the Victorians. To the Crystal Palace, the Crystal Palace. 2001 Crystal Palace. Cheers! Cheers. Cheers. Coming up on UK TV History, witness the discovery of an archaeological sensation, the magnificent tomb of an ice maiden.